Hello again everyone, welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in a testimony found in Volume 5 of the Testimonies for the Church. This was written in 1881 and it's actually titled Camp Meeting Address. And please be sure to go back and review the other few studies that I've already posted going through this testimony as it'll provide more of the context for the full testimony that Ellen White wrote out here. I'm just going to pick up right where we left off on, what is this, page 15 of Testimonies, Volume 5. It's a subheading called Responsibility of Ministers. And I'm only going to do the first half or so of it, and then I'll make a separate video going through the rest of it, as there is so much to contemplate and to consider, and there's a natural break in this section, this last portion of this letter that Ellen White wrote to be read at the camp meeting back in 1881. Um, just a quick reminder, it wasn't actually read at the camp meeting, it was forgotten, and then later it was read at a general conference meeting. So for more of that context, please watch the previous videos. So picking up under Responsibility of Ministers. A solemn responsibility rests upon the watchman. How careful should they be rightly to understand and explain the Word of God? Now, rather than just rushing through these testimonies, the purpose of going through the testimonies for the church is to contemplate the writings of Ellen White in the light of present truth so that we can get the lesson that was delivered and apply it to our own lives to self-examine, to make sure where we may be out of harmony with the counsel from the Holy Spirit given through Ellen White. And the reason why this is so important is because we have the privilege of hastening the return of Christ. The implications of that are that we also have a responsibility that we could delay Christ's return. And in the context of this testimony, she actually deals with uh, people she calls him those servants who say in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, you know, quoting from the Bible. That's the language used there. But it's so important to consider the whole context. Do we in our hearts, do we kind of think, well, yeah, you know, Christ isn't coming back anytime soon. We've gotten comfortable with just everyday life, kind of blending in with the world, kind of having a carefree attitude without feeling that sense of urgency that we want to hasten Christ's return. In fact, a couple paragraphs earlier in this same testimony, I'll actually read a little bit there to kind of back up what I'm saying. The thrilling truth that has been sounding in our ears for many years, the Lord is at hand, be ye also ready, is no less the truth today than when we first heard the message. Now, when we first heard the message, she's referring to William Miller proclaiming that Jesus was coming back soon back in the early 1800s because he was the one who first brought that to the attention of the Christian world. Prior to William Miller's message, it wasn't a consideration that Jesus was coming back soon. It was taught that his coming was far into the future. Then in the next paragraph, the one just preceding where we are picking up in Volume 5, she says, These momentous events are nigh at hand, yet many who profess to believe the truth are asleep. They will surely be numbered with the unfaithful servant who saith in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, if they remain in their present position of friendship with the world. So we can't have the attitude that Christ's coming is far away, it's something far off into the future. We have the privilege of hastening that event. So in that context, she then moves on to the responsibility of ministers. And one of the first things she says, as we just saw, is that there is a solemn responsibility resting upon the ministers. She calls them the watchmen. How careful should they be so how careful, careful about what? To rightly understand and explain the Word of God. 
okay, here's our opportunity. Let's pause. Let's apply this to ourselves. Are we as careful as we should be rightly to understand the Word of God, rightly to explain the Word of God? Are we prone to privately interpreting the scriptures? Are we prone to think that it's not a big deal to put our own ideas onto the meaning of scripture? Or are we very, very careful to make sure that we aren't missing anything, that we aren't misportraying God's instructions, counsels, warnings, reproofs, corrections, all of that? Are we careful rightly to understand and explain the Word of God. That is our responsibility if we have been called to be watchmen upon the walls of Zion. So please keep that in mind. Let's be very cautious when we are claiming something about God's teaching that we aren't spinning it from any preconceived idea or misunderstanding about what God has said. Let's make sure we are getting our source from inspired teachings. It's very, very important. And here's why. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Says the prophet Ezekiel, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet, and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So that's the end of the quotation from Ezekiel that Ellen White is using. So many important things there. And one of the key things that I really want to highlight is that there is a trumpet sound to be given as a warning. The trumpet sound is the message that God has given to the watchman. It's instruction, it's counsel, it's reproof, it's whatever is fitting for the circumstance in question. And God is very specific here in his instruction to Ezekiel. He's saying, warn those who are in danger from my mouth. Give them my message, not some privately interpreted message, not your own idea about what the warning should be, not your own idea of what the danger is. Warn them from me. So it has to be an inspired source from God, from Yahweh. So continuing with what Ellen White writes. 
the responsibility of the watchman of today is as much greater than in the days of the prophet as our light is clearer and our privileges and opportunities greater than theirs. There's a higher responsibility upon those of us today. Why? Because we have greater light. How? Why do we have greater light? Because God continued speaking through inspired messengers. And Ellen White, in her day, she was one of those messengers. And she was bringing more light, more instruction, more guidance. And so these watchmen, these ministers that she's counseling in her day, they have that extra light available. And so there is that greater responsibility. So there is a whole lot more light when Ellen White wrote this than Ezekiel had when he was receiving instruction and wrote his message down. And we need to take that into account that with more light comes greater responsibility. It is the minister's duty to warn every man, to teach every man, in all meekness and wisdom. He is not to conform to the practices of the world, but as God's servant, he must contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Satan is constantly at work to break down the strongholds which debar him from free access to souls. And while our ministers are no more spiritually minded, while they do not connect closely with God, the enemy has great advantage and the Lord holds the watchman accountable for his success. We have a great responsibility to keep a strong, a close connection to God. How are we going to do that? By staying connected to the messages that God sends by immersing ourselves in the contemplation and study of truth, by making sure that we rightly understand and rightly explain these truths and messages that God has sent. I would at this time sound the note of warning to those who shall assemble at our camp meeting the end of all things is at hand. My brethren, ministers, and laymen, I have been shown you must work in a different manner from what you have been in the habit of working. Now perk up here, guys, because this is ministers and laymen, right? That's everyone who could be listening to or watching this video right now. My brethren, she says, ministers and laymen, so there's no misunderstanding that it's not just ministers she's about to address here. I have been shown you must work in a different manner from what you have been in the habit of working. Well, what manner is that? She is about to explain. So here's where I want to remind us to really perk up again and be asking, does this apply to me? Pride, envy, self-importance, and unsanctified independence have marred your labors. Unsanctified independence? Well, sanctified means holy, made holy. Unsanctified would be something that is unholy. Unsanctified independence. So while we aren't to be drones and to be, you know, mindlessly receiving and carrying out orders or anything like that, we shouldn't be of a mindset that we don't need any guidance. We don't need any counsel. We can figure it out on our own and that sort of thing. We do have brains, we, we do have intelligence, we have been given the gift of being able to reason and discern things and, and to work through problems in our minds and that sort of thing, but without the guidance of truth that God sends to us, without that blessing of the Holy Spirit enlightening our minds, we will be very much in danger of falling under the influence of Satan, who is the prime example of that unsanctified independence. 
working separate from the guidance of the Holy Spirit, working contrary to divine instruction, that sort of thing. And so that was a, a phrase that really jumped out to me. They're all so important. We don't want to be prideful. We don't want to feel self-important. That unsanctified independence is kind of a sneaky one. I think that's why it stood out to me so much is because it tends to be less obvious to most of us. Unsanctified independence. I really want to encourage you to contemplate that, look into it, and ask God to help you to know if you have any unsanctified independence in your labors. When men permit themselves to be flattered and exalted by Satan, the Lord can do little for them or through them. To what unmeasured humiliation did the Son of Man descend that he might elevate humanity? Workers for God, not the ministers only, but the people, need the meekness and lowliness of Christ if they would benefit their fellow men. So I hear this so often from people, oh, you know, we, we haven't grown as a church because we haven't been taught that, which is true to a degree, but guess what? The ultimate responsibility really is with us if we have ever had the opportunity to hear the truth because we shouldn't continue to be babes needing to be fed with milk. We need to fully grow up as mature adult followers of Christ able to rightly discern truth. And we can't just sit back and wait for ministers to do everything for us and figure it all out for us. There's a whole lot of people to reach. There's a whole world to be saved. And there's only so many ministers. The lay people have a tremendous amount of work to do. So this council is for all of us. And let's not point fingers just at ministers. Let's always, or really at anybody other than ourselves, let's try to always be looking to how we can make a difference because as long as we all do that, what a difference will be made. Workers for God, not the ministers only, but the people need the meekness and lowliness of Christ if they would benefit their fellow men. As God, our Savior humbled himself when he took upon him man's nature, but he went lower still. As a man, quote, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, end quote. Would that I could find language wherewith to present these thoughts before you. Would that the veil could be rent away and you could see the cause of your spiritual weakness. Would that you could conceive of the rich supplies of grace and power awaiting your demand. Are you hearing that plea in her writing? You know, that's older English. It's not really the way we phrase things today, but something equivalent to that would be how I wish I could convey to you with language, you know, these sentiments. Oh, how I wish or how I long to be able to do this or that. Oh, how much I would love to be able to do this. So would that I could do this, would that you could do that. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. That's a beautiful promise. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not just scraping by, but righteousness, right doing, Christ's righteousness. What does Christ's righteousness look like? Those are all things that really need to be considered and studied into. I'd also like to refer you back to a video I have called Looking Unto Jesus. I think you'll really be blessed by that. I hope so, at least. We must exercise greater faith in calling upon God for all needed blessings. We must strive, agonize, to enter in at the straight gate. 
So there's effort that has to be made. We must strive, agonize to enter in at the straight gate, right? Do we do that? Says Christ, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. I testify to you, my dear brethren, ministers, and people, you have not yet learned this lesson. Wow. You have not yet learned this lesson. That's Ellen White's counsel in her day to these people. So here's where my ears perk up and I say, if that was the case for them, what is the case for me? So I highly encourage everyone, let's get in this habit of self-examining, making everything applicable to us. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. I am meek and lowly in heart. Earlier, Ellen White said that the workers for God, not the ministers only, but the people need, what do you remember? They need the meekness and lowliness of Christ if they would benefit their fellow men. She's saying, you haven't learned this lesson yet. Have we learned the lesson yet? We have the opportunity to. So let's continue. Christ endured shame and agony and death for us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Bear reproach and abuse without retaliation, without a spirit of revenge. Jesus died not only to make atonement for us, but to be our pattern. All right, now again, wow. Bear, reproach, abuse, all of that without retaliation, without a spirit of revenge. Christ died, or Jesus died, not only to make an atonement, right? He died to be our pattern. He went through excruciating agonies, and the record is that he didn't retaliate. He didn't have a spirit of revenge. He felt love for these people and sympathy and sadness, of course, that they were operating by such horrible, unloving, disgusting principles. And this spirit of retaliation this spirit of, you don't have a right to talk to me that way, that is not the example that Christ gave us. That isn't how we should respond or react when we are abused in any way. Really contemplate that. Really think about that. It's not something that comes naturally to us. We have to strive. We have to agonize to enter into the straight gate. But as we take upon us Christ's yoke, as we carry his burdens, as we live his life, as we follow his example, we will realize, man, this is a lot easier than trying to grab that weighty bundle and pull it with all my might. Having that lightweight distributed with that yoke upon our shoulders and just, you know, just moving along following Christ's example, we'll realize how light it is. He's already given us the example to follow and all we have to do is get to know him, understand his character, learn to love it, follow it, trust in the promises once we follow, once we act on his example, we will learn that it is easy to do and that we will find rest to our souls. She's going to touch on that principle a little bit more about acting upon things and finding how easy it is. So please stay tuned. I'm going to get there in this video. 
bear reproach and abuse without retaliation, without a spirit of revenge. Jesus died not only to make atonement for us, but to be our pattern. Oh, wondrous condescension, matchless love, as you look upon the Prince of Life upon the cross, can you cherish selfishness? Can you indulge hatred or revenge? Can you? You know, as you look upon Christ and you contemplate what he went through and how he responded, can you cherish selfishness? Can you indulge hatred or revenge? Let the proud spirit bow in humiliation. Let the hard heart be broken. No longer pet and pity and exalt self. Look, oh, look upon him whom our sins have pierced. See him descending step by step the path of humiliation to lift us up, abasing himself till he could go no lower, and all to save us who were fallen by sin. Why will we be so indifferent, so cold, so formal, so proud, so self-sufficient? Who of us is faithfully following the pattern? Big, heavy questions. Who of us is faithfully following the pattern? These are terribly important questions. Why will we be so indifferent? So indifferent? You may say, I'm not indifferent. By our actions, we show whether we're indifferent or not, right? Are we working to warn people of the impending danger? Are we giving that trumpet a certain, a definitive sound? Are we proclaiming the messages that God has given us to proclaim? Why will we be so cold, so formal, so proud, so self-sufficient? These are questions you have to ask yourself. Does it apply to you? If so, why are you being that way? What's the remedy? And the remedy is look unto Jesus. Who of us has instituted and continued the warfare against pride of heart. So it's not enough to just institute that. It's not enough to make a declaration and say, okay, yeah, I want to get rid of this pride of heart. No, we have to continue that warfare. It will be necessary to fight against temptation so long as Satan and sin exists on this world and in the universe because sin has tainted even heaven, right? Um, we need to not only institute, but continue the warfare against pride of heart. Who of us has, in good earnest, brought himself to wrestle with selfishness until it should no longer dwell in the heart and be revealed in the life? That's a great question. Who of us has in good earnest, like with, with lots of, of enthusiasm, good earnest, good faith, when you put an earnest down, it's like a down payment. Who has made those steps? Who has brought himself to wrestle with selfishness until it should no longer dwell in the heart and be revealed in the life? That until is a key word in this question. Until it should no longer dwell in the heart and be revealed in the life. In other words, that's the goal. What does that look like? That is what Christ's righteousness looks like. He didn't have selfishness dwelling in the heart and revealed in the life we can have that same experience every minute of every day because Christ was our perfect example and everything has been provided for us to completely fulfill God's purpose for us. We can 
live a life free of selfishness. And that's what Christ is longing for. Christ is waiting for his people to have his character perfectly reproduced in them, perfectly reproduced in us, so that he can come to claim us as his own. It's a wonderful concept. Who of us has, in good earnest, brought himself to wrestle with selfishness until it should no longer dwell in the heart and be revealed in the life? Would to God the lessons given us as we view the cross of Christ and see the signs fulfilling which bring us near to the judgment might be so impressed upon our hearts as to render us more humble, more self-denying, more kind to one another, less self-caring, less critical, and more willing to bear one another's burdens than we are today. So again, there's that kind of older way of expressing like, I wish so much that this would happen. So would to God. So what is she wanting? She wants the lessons given us to be so impressed upon our hearts as to render us more humble, uh, more self-denying, all these different things, you know, more caring and all that. But she says, would to God the lessons given us, and then she adds a little something between these um, commas. She says, as we view the cross of Christ, so we are to be doing something in order to bring this about. So as we view the cross of Christ and we see the signs fulfilling, which bring us near to the judgment. Now keep in mind, the judgment for the dead had already opened. So the only thing she could be referring to here as far as the judgment is our own judgment, the judgment for the living or the judgment of the living. That's really important for us, right? Because those of us who are alive right now, we need to hear these messages of warning. Would to God the lessons given us as we view the cross of Christ and see the signs fulfilling which bring us near to the judgment might be so impressed upon our hearts as to render us you know, all these more positive things, right? We need to have Christ's character perfectly reproduced in us so that he can come to claim us as his own. That's how we will be able to stand in the judgment by having that record of sin wiped away and having Christ's character seen in our place so long as we don't continue to place new sins upon our record. Once the judgment is finished, that's it. And our character has to stand it won't be the case that just because a certain timeline comes around that if we haven't managed to have Christ's character perfectly reproduced in us that God's going to suddenly say, well, you know, that's okay, you're close enough. The heavenly beings will not be happy if God allows any kind of sin back into heaven, right? That's what caused this whole problem in the first place. So we need to be really having this in mind. It's a very solemn thing. We're called to be watchmen and to sound this message of warning so that as many as will hear and reform can be saved. I have been shown that as a people, we are departing from the simplicity of the faith and from the purity of the gospel. Many are in great peril. Unless they change their course, they will be severed from the true vine as useless branches. Brethren and sisters, I have been shown that we are standing upon the threshold of the eternal world, we need now to gain victories at every step. Okay, so let me get your attention again. Earlier I mentioned that I was going to be coming up to something regarding, um, you know, having victories and, and different things like that and obtaining victory at every step. So this is it. We need now 
to gain victories at every step. Every good deed is as a seed sown to bear fruit unto eternal life. Every success gained places us on a higher round of the ladder of progress and gives us spiritual strength for fresh victories. Every right action prepares the way for its repetition. Now, why am I stressing on this? Because it's instructive. It's showing us how to have more victory, how to come to that point of being able to have victory every moment of every day, victory over every temptation. Elmite says that we can have the strength to overcome every temptation of Satan. So how can we do that? Well, for starters, of course, we have to immerse ourselves in the Word and learn of Christ, but then we, we have to take action. We need now to gain victories at every step, every good deed, is as a seed sown to bear fruit unto eternal life. Why is that? Because every time you do something right, instead of doing something wrong, you are training yourself for the positive. Because if you repetitively do something that you know to be wrong, you are training yourself to do that. On the other hand, if you repeatedly choose to do something that you know to be right when you could have chosen to do something that you know to be wrong, by choosing to do that action which is right instead of the wrong action, you are training yourself to do that which is right. You are forming these neural pathways in your brain that make it easier and more natural to do the right thing. And that makes sense in the light of Ellen White's statement where she says um, something along the lines of that by doing God's will, we will be but carrying out our own impulses. So how do we get there in the first place? We have to gain victories at every step. We have to choose to do the right now. And that's like planting a seed, right? You plant that seed, and then as you continue to water it with truth, as you continue to study and learn of Christ, there's nourishment brought into that seed and that action then it grows, right? And it produces fruit. And you then have more seed produced, more right actions, and it becomes a fruitful bough, so to speak. So um, it gives us spiritual strength for fresh victories. I just put God to the test. Do this if you will actively choose to do right things when you could have chosen to do wrong things. Choose to do right things. Choose to think rightly. Choose to view people well. Choose to be more kind, more loving, more patient, more forbearing. Don't retaliate if someone abuses you um, seek to do good, you know, and you will be strengthened. Every right action prepares the way for its repetition. Some are closing their probation, and is it well with them? Have they obtained a fitness for the future life? Those are important questions. Have we obtained fitness for the future life? Will we be fit to enter into sacred space? Are we going to be fit to be welcomed into the society of heaven? Now is where we have probationary time. We will have to develop our characters here and now. There's no probation after Christ comes. I think it's very important to keep that in mind in light of this council. Will not their records show wasted opportunities, neglected privileges, a life of selfishness and worldliness that has borne no fruit to the glory of God? And how much of the work which the Master has left for us to do has been left undone? All around us are souls to be warned, but how often has the time been occupied in self-serving and the record gone up to God of souls passing to their graves unwarned 
and unsaved. The Lord still has purposes of mercy toward us. There is room for repentance. We may become the beloved of God. I entreat you who have put far off the appearing of our Lord. Commence now the work of redeeming the time. Study the word of God. Let all at this meeting make a covenant with God to put away light and trifling conversation and frivolous, unimportant reading. And for the coming year, diligently and prayerfully study the Bible that you may be able to give to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Will you not without delay humble your hearts before God and repent of your backslidings? This is where I'm going to draw a close to this video and this portion of the testimony because these are important questions, right? Let's just review it a little bit before we draw it to a close. She's given warning and then she's saying the Lord still has purposes of mercy toward us. There's still probationary time. God still loves us. There's still room for repentance. Yeah, the people that she was writing to, they were in a very bad, backslidden state. And you may be in a very bad, backslidden state. But there is still room for repentance. We may, you may, I may become the beloved of God. Then she entreats the reader, I entreat you who have put far off the appearing of our Lord, commence now. The time is always now. If you have delayed in the past, that is gone. You can't change that. But you can choose now to do something, to act, to do a right action, to gain a victory now, to pave the way to repeat that victory. Commence now the work of redeeming the time. Study the Word of God. Let all, watching this video, she wrote at this meeting, let all at this meeting, make a covenant. Let's make a covenant with God to put away light and trifling conversation, frivolous, unimportant reading or viewing or whatever the case may be. They didn't have TV and movies and stuff like that back then. Uh, TV and movies isn't inherently bad on their own right. Neither was reading bad on its own right. It's what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you viewing? What are you listening to? Don't make it anything like trifling or obscene, of course. Obviously, some of those other more um, extreme examples. But don't even allow trifling, unimportant things to occupy your time and energy. Diligently, prayerfully study the Bible, study inspiration, study the writings that God has inspired to be written with these messages of counsel and reproof. Study the third angel's message contained in the testimonies for the church. Study everything that you can get your hands on, the most present truth that you have available to you. Study that. It will make a difference. The reason why is so that you may be able to give to every man that asks you, why do you have this hope? You can give them the reasons, not just, oh, just take it on faith, right? I can't give you any reasons. That's just what I think, what I feel. No, we are supposed to have reasons for the hope that is within us. We should do it with meekness, with, she says, fear. I would say respect, meekness, and re respect in this context. And don't delay to humble our hearts before God. Let's not delay to do that. Let's just do it right now. Let's repent of our backslidings. That is the plea. That is the invitation. There's a responsibility that we have. And let's make a covenant to fulfill that responsibility. Thank you for studying the testimonies for the church. May you be blessed. Shalom.